Amen. Uh, my name's Jason. I want to add my greeting uh, to Carl's. Um, I'm one of the pastors here and I want to welcome you this morning. Really glad that you're with us. I know there's lots of places you could be this morning, and particularly if you're visiting. We're really thankful that you have chosen to come and be with us uh, this morning. Also want to welcome those that are joining us online uh, from home. And also, we have about 70 people maybe down in room 101 and 102 from the Crossroads community uh, that have graciously agreed to be in the overflow room this morning so that we can gather here uh, together and get more people uh, in the sanctuary. So thank you all for uh, gathering in the overflow uh, this morning. Uh, The bulletin and the announcements can be found online. They were scrolling when you came in this morning, but one I want to highlight, believe it or not, many of you have signed up for this already, but we had plans to have a membership class, a new members class in March, and then the pandemic hit, and so we put that on pause. Well, it's here. We're going to start it in November. Uh, You can see all the information uh, on how you can sign up in the bulletin uh, if you're interested in becoming a member uh, of our church. If you have your Bible, a copy of God's Word, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be, if you have a copy of God's Word, keep it open this morning. We'll be referring to chapter 7 uh, towards the end, and that will be helpful for you. With that in mind, let me read God's Word. This is the Word of the Lord, Revelation chapter 6. I'll only be reading chapter 6, but I'll refer to chapter 7. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And he came, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. When I opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. When he heard, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts on the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, this is amazing stuff here. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were under, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth, the the full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that had been rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place And then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. 
calling to the mountains, listen to this, and the rocks to fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of God. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us this morning. Father, come through your spirit. And would you take uh, this passage and would you apply it to each and every heart in this room this morning? Would you show us the Lord Jesus Christ? I pray that you would draw people to yourself, that you would in, you give us this vivid image of the day of judgment. Use this in our lives this morning. Draw people to faith in Christ. Those that are watching, draw them in. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Help us to see that Jesus is our shelter and our security. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, you know that football is back. You have probably been watching a lot of football since the SEC started back a couple of weeks ago. And if you were watching yesterday, uh, in every game, at some point, there is a close call. And nowadays, because of the technology, when there's a close call, it immediately uh, goes to the review booth. And you're watching on TV all of these different angles of this play. And you are getting clarity on what exactly happened in the play. We're getting a fuller perspective, if you will. Well, in some ways, that's the book of Revelation. Revelation is pulling back the curtain and giving us a more complete and fuller perspective on the world. And in this passage... We are, the curtain is pulled back and we see a complete and more fuller picture of specifically this morning, suffering. And remember, the book of Revelation, we've got to always go back to the original audience. This is written to a particular people in a particular time. And these Christians uh, that John is writing to, the apostle John, they are suffering terribly because they follow Jesus. In Revelation, he gives them this book. Now, who would give Revelation to give people uh, encouragement and hope? John would, and we should. He gives them this book in order to encourage them and give them hope in their suffering. Revelation chapter 5, if you remember last week, there was one seated on the throne, and he was holding the scroll on his, in his right hand, and the Lamb of God, Jesus, was the only one that was worthy to open up the scroll. And we learned last week that the scroll contained the complete and perfect, it had seven seals, the complete and perfect plan of God for human history. And in this chapter, Revelation 6, we see that the lamb starts to open up the seals and break them. And what we learned this morning is that the plan of God for the world involves human suffering. And this morning, as we get this fuller perspective on suffering, my hope is just like the original readers, that this morning we will leave here with courage and we will leave here with hope. I want us this morning uh, to develop as much as we can from this passage a theology of suffering. And to do that, we're going to look at three points. The reality of suffering, the reason for our suffering, and then the response to suffering. So let's look at those this morning. Number one, the first heading, the reality of suffering. Look at chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Notice the four seals are held together. They go together. Uh, they're linked by the four living creatures. Remember the four living creatures from chapter 4 are all of creation. That will come be significant in a minute. And in chapters 4 and 5, uh, we see those creatures. And now those creatures are saying, come before each event in the passage. 
And, and one of the questions we need to ask is, who are the writers? Well, we know, and this is a, a, actually a, a well-known passage in Revelation, they're known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so let's look at each of those briefly. The white horse, verse 2. Uh, white horses were symbols of conquest and victory. And so the white horse is best understood as a symbol of corrupt and of corrupt human and political power uh, that wants to bring oppression to the people. The red horse, blood red, was a symbol of blood. And this horse brings in verse 4 the calamity and slaughter and bloodshed. And it says the rider takes peace from the earth and represents war and conflict and violence. The black horse, look at verses 5 and 6. The rider of the black horse brings scales, measuring out the grains and their prices representing uh, famine in the world. And you see this voice among the four living creatures explains the price of food and says that it's very, very high while while the rich continue to live in luxury. That's what we see here with the command not to damage the oil and the wine. Who were the primary drinkers of oil and wine? The wealthy. Verse 8, the sickly horse or the pale horse. The last rider was death, and this rider draws all of these horses together and rides alongside them, bringing death through war and disease and pestilence and pandemics and famine. And so what's the point? Well, the point is that this is what you should expect now living in this world. This is what we should expect between the first coming of Christ and we're waiting his second coming it's been called in between the times. That's where we live. We live looking back at Jesus and we look forward to Jesus coming again. We should expect in this time in which we live, suffering in the form of conquest, war, violence, greed, poverty, viruses, disease, and death. You see, there's no need to see and connect these riders to the so-called Great Tribulation. These riders are riding now. There's been tribulation and suffering since Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of Adam and Eve. And isn't that what we see to be true in the world around us? I mean, think about it. If, if this afternoon you were to go home and you were to take a family walk on this beautiful day or sit out back uh, in your, uh, on, on your porch and one of your children were to say, hey, mom or dad, could you give me a basic outline of American history? What would you say? Well, you could say lots of things, but most likely you would start with the Revolutionary War. You would go to the War of 1812. You would talk about the Civil War and the First and Second World War. You would most certainly talk about the famine of the Great Depression. Is this sounding familiar? The Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, the war in Iraq. You would definitely talk about 9-11. And most certainly as we move forward in history, we're going to be talking about 2020 and a global pandemic, the pestilence, so to speak. You see, that's not just our history. That's every civilization that has ever lived. These horsemen have been riding and will continue to ride until Jesus comes back and ushers in the new heavens and new earth and completes the plan of God. And we'll see that in Revelation chapter 21. So what? What does this teach us about suffering and developing our theology of suffering? Well, this might sound obvious, but I think it's important to say we should expect suffering. The Bible never shies away from suffering. It assumes it. 
And it teaches us that we should expect it, that it is a normal part of life in a fallen and broken world. But we try to avoid this reality, don't we? We try to deny this reality. In campus ministry, if I saw it once, I saw it a hundred times. Students would come to our campus and their families had shielded them from suffering and disappointment. And then they got hit by reality in college and experienced suffering and they completely fell apart, shut down, and didn't know how to cope with life. And yes, listen, we need wisdom. And there are certain things we do need to shield our kids from when it comes to suffering. But we also need to be careful. We need to be very careful that we don't ever give the impression that if they just do the right things, and if they live a certain way, or if they are successful, or if they move to the right neighborhoods, that they can avoid suffering. The riders, you cannot stop them from riding. They will continue to ride. Money, medicine, and education, nor having a strong faith. Think about the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Nor having a strong faith can prevent suffering. And I know this is hard to hear. It's hard to preach. But actually, I think this is helpful because it's when we're surprised by suffering that we get bitter, angry, and cynical at the world and at our lives. So that's number one, the reality of suffering in the world. Secondly, the reason for our suffering. Notice that each of the breaking of the seals, the four living creatures cry, Come, verses 1, 3, 5, and 7. The question is, who are they calling to come? It can't be John. John's already there observing this vision. Others have suggested that the four living creatures are calling the four horsemen to come and to do their work on the earth. But that doesn't make sense either. Remember, the four living creatures are represent and symbolize all creation. Why would creation call someone to come and destroy itself? Commentator Daryl Johnson says the four living creatures are not calling John. They're not calling the four horsemen. They are calling the Lord Jesus, King Jesus, to come. And to bring his kingdom to earth in its fullness. Think about the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They are calling on Jesus. How do we know this? Because it's the cry of the entire book of Revelation. It's the cry of the entire Bible, we could say. Remember Romans chapter 11, the apostle Paul says, All creation is groaning for God to come and to free it from its bondage and decay and sin. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, you see these bookends in the entire book of Revelation. 1 7 says Jesus is coming. Not will come, is coming. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am coming. And because Jesus is coming, and this is what we see in Revelation 6, the four horsemen create great upheaval in the world by bringing violence and ruin and poverty and death. We're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare. The Bible assumes it. Revelation assumes it. When you pull back the curtain on this world, you see a spiritual battle that is going on. And we'll see this again more clearly in a few weeks. And the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities of darkness and evil. When you pull back the curtain, this shows us that evil is at work in the world trying to overthrow Jesus and his kingdom. And Jesus and his kingdom are pressing in with healing and with righteousness and truth. And the enemy pushes back and responds with the full force of the four horsemen. Bringing disease and violence and greed and death. Revelation chapter 6 is saying that suffering is going on not because Jesus is absent. 
Not because he's distant, but because he's here. And he's bringing his kingdom, again, not yet in its fullness, but he's bringing it and it's pressing into the world and the enemy is pushing back against it with the four horsemen. But notice verse 2. It's easy to miss. Was given. Verse 4. Was permitted to take peace from the earth was given a great sword. Did you notice this? Verse 8, were given authority over. The four horsemen were given authority. By whom? By the one who sits on the throne. Now, I know this is hard for us to get our minds around, but it is an important aspect in our theology of suffering. Evil is not in charge. It's on a leash. And the whole Bible insists that evil and suffering is only allowed to operate within the parameters granted to it by God to serve his good purposes in the world. And listen, I know that's not an easy pill to swallow. I know that's very difficult for us to understand. There's nothing evil or nothing easy talking about God's sovereignty over human suffering. It doesn't fit into our categories. But think about it, isn't it better to know that God is using suffering to work out his purposes in the world for reasons that we might not understand and do not understand rather than living in a world in which evil and suffering suffering happen randomly for no reason at all? You see, just because you and I don't see a good reason for suffering doesn't mean that there isn't one. And this is why, remember we said this last week, Revelation 4 and 5 are the throne room, the most important chapters, and everything flows out of the throne room. We've got to remember that the scroll, that God is on his throne, and the plan of this world includes famine and war and greed and death. And we look at those things and we think, surely God has left us. Things are not as they seem. God has not left us. He takes pandemics and death and war and violence and he uses, he's even so in control that he uses those things in order to work out his plan and his good purposes in the world. Lastly, our response to suffering. Nine and ten. I saw under the altar, the altar is where the blood of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, the the blood would pull under the altar or it would be poured there. You'd see the souls of those slain on account of the word of God. And notice what they cry out with a loud voice. O sovereign, O God who is in control of all things. How long, Lord, holy and true, how long before you will come and avenge our blood? Do you see what's happening? They are, the martyrs are crying out and basically praying the exact same thing that the four living creatures are praying. Come, come Jesus. And they're not praying a prayer of vengeance. It's a prayer of justice for the wrongs in the world to be made right. And is this not our cry to It's the cry of the martyrs, how long, O Lord? Is that not also our cry? How long, O Lord, will we have to deal with cancer? How long, O Lord, will parents have to bury their children? How long, O Lord, will we see a world that's ravaged by violence and division and war and terrorism and disease? You see, a good theology of suffering gives you permission to cry. It gives you permission to lament and to look at the world and to weep and to cry out with the martyrs, How long, O Lord? till you come back and make things right. 
It's really easy for us, I think, when we see and we see it around in our world, it's easy for us to see the chaos and the suffering of the world and to just simply get angry and bitter and cynical when we look at the suffering in the world. It's when we need to remember that anger is a secondary emotion. The reason why we get angry is because we don't know how to be sad. It's way easier for us to point the finger and to get angry than to feel sadness and to weep over the suffering of the world around us. Let me ask you a question. Have you wept over what you've seen in the last six months? More specifically, have you wept over COVID-19? Have you wept over what this virus has done to our world and to people we love and to our communities and to our country? And think about our church community. I mean, it's not just this, our church, but churches all over the world went weeks without being together. That should make us weep. And not only that, just think about even this morning, we're meeting in four different places (laughs) physically. We're here in this sanctuary. We've got a lot of people I'm looking at in the upper gathering hall. We've got people downstairs. We've got lots and lots of people that are dear to this church that are at home watching on the live stream. Think about how this has separated us physically. And it should make us weep. It should make us cry out with the martyrs, how long, O Lord, will the horsemen ride and wreak havoc on this earth? And it should make us cry with John at the end of the book of Revelation, the very last verse. You know what John says? Come, Lord Jesus, come and bring your kingdom to earth. That's the first response is to lament the suffering But there's also another cry that we see in this text. Look at verses 12 through 17. The sixth seal is open for the first, and for the first time, it fast forwards to the end of time when Jesus will come again. So we get a preview here of Judgment Day. Because all of these images are taken from the Old Testament, and they're symbols of ultimate judgment. And we're going to see, we'll even see it next week with the trumpets, but there are these symbols of Old Testament imagery uh, of, of judgment. And the details are not as important as the main point. Again, I'm trying to keep us from getting bogged down in all the details. The main point is this. Judgment is real, and it is coming. We can't lose sight of that. Feel the force. Look at verses 16 and 17. Please feel the force of these verses. Did you catch the fact that people who are opposing God are praying and crying out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them rather than to have to face the wrath of God and the one who sits on the throne? So much so that in verse 17, they say, who can stand? You see, it doesn't matter how religious you are. Think about all the people listed, kings and money how well-liked, how smart, how beautiful, how great your emotional experience was when you were a teenager, how zealous you are, how much money you have. No one can stand on the judgment day on their own two feet. And so what do we do? Remember, there's good news. There's always good news. We find shelter in Jesus. We get underneath the altar with the martyrs and we get underneath Jesus because it's only in Jesus that we're safe and secure from the ultimate suffering. The only thing that can truly hurt us and that is the wrath of God on judgment day. Look at chapter 7 again. Look, if you don't, we didn't read it, but flip with me to chapter 7 verse 1. There's an interlude before the seventh seal is opened. The seventh seal doesn't come to chapter 8. We see this interlude, and this is some amazing stuff. So the angels are released to the corners of the earth, 
And then these angels cry out, stop, don't open the sixth seal. They don't open the sixth seal. Why? Don't bring the day of judgment, they're saying. Verse 3, wait until God gathers up all of his people. Wait until they are sealed. The servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. We're not going to talk about the 144,000 today because they show up again in Revelation 14, but the, just simply the 144,000 is representative of the complete people of God. So don't come, the angels saying, until the complete people of God have been gathered up and been sealed. Wait. Because if God opens the sixth seal, that's it. It's over. And that all of a sudden brings to life 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, doesn't it? The Lord is slow to come, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God has not opened the sixth seal yet because he's given your friends and your family time to come to Christ. Or maybe he's given you, if you don't know Jesus this morning, he's given you time to come to Jesus and find shelter. Let me say it, let me say it another way. The purpose of, one of the purposes of suffering is to draw people to Jesus to find shelter. If you're already a Christian and you've been sealed by Jesus, suffering changes and purifies you and makes you cling to Jesus more tightly. It changes you and makes you more like him. And so what does it mean that God seals you? When the ancient Near East, the scroll would be rolled up and they would put wax on it in order to seal it. And then the king would take his signet ring and press it into the wax. And that was a way of saying what is in this scroll is trustworthy and true. It was a way of the king saying, these things are mine. Don't mess with them. They are sealed. And so if you are a believer in Jesus this morning, God's ring of authority has sealed you to himself. It has sealed you. And because of that, no harm can come to you on that great day of judgment. Why? Look at verse 14. Because Jesus has washed you in his robes. And he has made it white in the blood of the lamb. You cannot stand on your own. You cannot bring your own resume to the great day of judgment. You can only stand on that day. On the merit of and on the blood of Jesus the Lamb. And in John chapter 10, it says that no one, remember that in John chapter 10, no one can be snatched out of his hands. Friends, that's security. That is safety and shelter. And if you are sheltered in Jesus and sealed in Jesus, then you can face anything that this world throws at you. You can face the four horsemen this morning. It's only as you are sealed in shelter in Jesus that you will be safe and secure for the great day of judgment when Jesus will come and he will bring his justice against the four horsemen. And so the question is, will you come to Jesus this morning and find shelter? Will you come and find security? And that's an invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for providing shelter for us. Forgive us for thinking that we can stand on our own merit and our own resume. Holy Spirit, would you come and Teach us to lament. We see that all through the scriptures, all through the history of the church. They knew how to lament. Would you teach us how to lament over suffering? If there's anyone here this morning or watching that has not found, found shelter in you, would you draw them to yourself and give them faith? Open their ears, give them ears to hear and eyes to see. 
in Jesus' name, amen.